As I grip the controls of our deep sea submersible, the crushing depths of the Pacific engulf us in darkness. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Hartley, marine biologist, and beside me is Commander John Sullivan. He's a hard-edged Navy veteran with more time underwater than any of us. We're part of a research team to explore and document the depths of the oceans. Depth check, I say, my voice bouncing around our enclosed world, humming the silent abyss. 25,000 feet and counting, John responds, his gaze fixed on the descending numbers. The anticipation of our mission builds, it's electrifying. We're here to collect and study new life forms in the trenches where no human has ventured before. It's exhilarating and terrifying in equal measures. About an hour into our descent, the deep sea realm finally begins to unfold before us. The floodlights mounted on our submersible cut through the abyss, painting an otherworldly picture onto the canvas of our viewport. We're in a land untouched by the sun, a domain of stillness and immense pressure, where life has to adapt to survive in ways we can hardly imagine. The ocean floor appears to us like a desolate moonscape. Strange, rocky outcroppings rise from the seabed, populated by eerie, bioluminescent plants that glow. Towering hydrothermal vents, like chimneys from Hades, spew columns of black, nutrient-rich smoke around which an assortment of bizarre creatures gather. Our lights dance over a spider crab, its skeletal legs spanning over a meter, navigating the ocean floor with a terrifying elegance. Its body armor, a mosaic of bristly hairs and knobs, lends it an unsettling appearance. Then, an enormous deep sea cucumber comes into view, a fat, squishy tube with luminous skin, trailing a ghostly array of feeding tentacles, pulsing as it filters the water for food. We drift further and find a gulper eel, a creature with a massively distended jaw that seems capable of swallowing creatures much larger than itself. Its slender, eel-like body ending in a whip-like tail that darts and twitches, creating a mesmerizing spectacle. Not far from the eel, the twinkling lights of our submersible illuminate a school of viper fish, their metallic bodies glittering in the dark. Their monstrous appearances, equipped with needle-like teeth and hinged lower jaws, make them seem like they've sprung from a child's darkest nightmares. We pass by a field of two worms, clinging to the hot vents and wafting in the current like nightmarish flowers from a garden of the deep. Their long, red plumes, designed for absorbing nutrients, give off a spectral glow, making them appear as fiery specters against the black canvas of the ocean floor. Suddenly, our eyes catch a fascinating spectacle. Out of the abyss, an enchanting and ghostly figure emerges. It's unlike anything we've encountered before, a creature so unique it challenges our understanding of life itself. Imagine a shadow, but not an ordinary one, cast by something solid blocking the light. No, this is a living shadow, a sentient darkness that dances and sways, that shimmers and undulates with an almost hypnotic rhythm. It's a three-dimensional silhouette brought to life, not absorbing but embodying the darkness around it. There's an uncanny beauty to it, a grace that is utterly alien yet strangely familiar. Its appearance makes my heart race and my breath hitch, and I realize that I am in the presence of something genuinely extraordinary. The creature constantly shifts like smoke caught in a gentle breeze, forming patterns and shapes that defy description. At times it seems to mimic the creatures of the deep we've seen, a bioluminescent jellyfish, a sinuous eel, but then it goes further, its form morphing into shapes that have no counterparts in our natural world, abstract, constantly changing, a mesmerizing kaleidoscope of darkness. The most astounding thing about it is a creature's ability to alter its density. One moment is as thick and viscous as crude oil, inky darkness that you feel you could almost touch, only for it to dissolve a moment later into a near-transparent mist, a wraith drifting in the water. Its body, if you could call it that, ebbs and flows, an ephemeral blend of substance and specter, constantly blurring the boundaries between the tangible and the ethereal. My mind struggles to categorize it, to draw comparisons to something, anything that I know. But it's like trying to describe a color one's never seen, a sound one's never heard. This creature, this living shadow, is a marvel that defies all my scientific understanding, a being that truly belongs to the unexplored depths of our world. Jesus, Liz, what the hell is that? John murmurs, his eyes wide with awe and a tinge of fear. I don't know, John. Nothing in our data or in our wildest theories hinted at something like this. I whisper back, spellbound. It's John who breaks the silence. 
his voice barely a whisper against the oppressive quiet. We can't just stand by while our team disappears, Liz. He says, a note of accusation in his voice. I know, John. I respond, trying to sound confident. But we're in an environment as dangerous as it is unknown. There could be any number of explanations. Really? He scoffs. Do you really believe that, or are you just trying to keep us calm? I don't answer, not because I don't want to, but because I can't. Not without lying. As the submarine's clock beats steadily into the late hours, we're living a spiraling nightmare. It's not just the oppressive darkness of the ocean depths or the chill seeping through the metallic walls of our vessel that sets our nerves on edge. The creature lingers near our lights, seeming to sense our presence, our curiosity. Its form is constantly changing like an eternal morphing puzzle. It's otherworldly, captivating, and I feel a strange, unspoken connection to it. We spend what feels like an eternity observing, recording, and hypothesizing. But as scientists, we know our place. We're observers, not participants. So with a shared, regretful glance at John, I power up the submersible and we start our reluctant withdrawal. But as we begin our ascent, I feel a chill, a twist in my gut. Something in the way the creature followed our light, studied us as we studied it, makes me feel uncomfortable. An irrational fear gnaws at me, but I shake it off as the nerves from an intense encounter. Back aboard the submersible, John breaks the silence. That was different. He admits, his face betraying a mix of awe and unease. Yes, it was. I reply, my voice trailing off, my thoughts consumed by the enigmatic creature we've just encountered. They blend into each other in the oppressive darkness of the ocean deep, the monotony broken only by the increasing sense of unease aboard our submersible. It starts with subtle changes, things that seem strange, but could be explained away as quirks of the deep sea environment or the psychological strain of our mission. The radio signal from the surface becomes garbled, communication cutting out at random intervals, leaving us in eerie silence. The onboard systems start behaving erratically, flickering lights and fluctuating temperature, and this quiet seeping into the submersible's metallic veins. We rationalize these as technical glitches, the stress of the extreme environment on our machinery. But deep down, I can't shake off the feeling that it's something more. Then there's the knocking. Random, unexplained sounds echoing through the hull, as if something were tapping on the outer shell of the submersible. It's not the usual creaking and groaning of the pressure on the hull, but rather something distinct and deliberate. Personal items start to go missing, only to reappear later in odd places. A photograph that hung in my cabin is found in the mess hall. John's lucky charm, a naval coin he keeps on his person at all times, disappears and shows up in the control room. And worst of all, our team members start disappearing, not just while they are alone, but right under our noses. Mid-conversation, mid-experiment, they turn a corner, pass through a doorway, and when we follow, they're gone. Their stations are deserted, their beds untouched, as if they simply evaporated into thin air. There are no signs of struggle, no alarms triggered, and no distress signals. They're there one moment, and the next they're gone. All this accumulates into a heavy dread that wraps around us like a shroud, turning every crew member into a potential shadow. An uncomfortable silence becomes our soundtrack as the usual hum of conversation dies down. We huddle together in the control room, the fear clearly etched on each face, our glances skittering around like nervous insects under the harsh, artificial light. It's the vanishing of our crew members, one after another, swallowed by an unseen menace. It feels as if the shadows are claiming them, leaving nothing behind but a silence that's growing louder with each passing moment. We are a team of professionals, scientists, and sailors both, yet this pattern, this inexplicable disappearance of our colleagues is unsettling. They're here one moment, laughing, working, breathing, and the next they're gone, leading behind unmanned stations and untouched beds. We search every inch of the submersible, every nook and cranny, but they vanish without a trace. As the hours turn into days, our worry becomes tinged with an ever-growing sense of dread. There are hushed conversations, sidelong glances, and tension. We are beginning to suspect something beyond our understanding, something lurking in the... Our world tilts on its axis when Dr. Edwards, our linguist, walks into the control room one evening. He disappeared two days ago, his voice last heard echoing through the communication systems. His reappearance should bring relief, but instead it stirs a whole new fear. You okay, Edwards? 
John asks, a suspicious crease forming on his forehead. Edwards is off, wrong somehow. He greets us with his familiar smile, but it's hollow and rehearsed. He repeats the same phrase in a disturbing loop. Just another day in the abyss, right guys? There's no humor in his tone, no spark in his eyes, only a mechanical repetitiveness. The sinking feeling intensifies when John, a seasoned naval officer, tests Edwards. He brings out a photograph from Edwards' cabin, a family picture that should stir up love, memories, a sense of home. Do you recognize them, Edwards? John's voice is edged with suspicion. Edwards looks at the photograph, chuckles mechanically, and repeats his taunting phrase, devoid of any recognition or emotion. That's the moment when the horrifying truth crashes down on us. He isn't Edwards anymore. He is an echo, a phantom wearing Edwards' face, speaking with his voice. The real Edwards isn't missing. He's been replaced by something that has learned to mimic him, down to the finest detail. We're not just fighting an unseen predator. We're up against an entity that can become us, wear our faces, speak with our voices, and erase us from existence. The chill that sweeps over us is colder than the water surrounding our submersible. This shadowy menace doesn't just take our crew, it becomes them. And the terrifying question looms larger than ever, who will be next? The relationship between John and me, once marked by friendly banter and a shared love for exploration, has become a complicated dance of suspicion and mistrust. There are times when our eyes meet, and the mutual respect is replaced by a flicker of doubt. In those chilling moments, we don't see each other as the trusted colleagues we once were. Instead, we see a potential imposter, a shadow creature adorning a familiar face. One day, with the ocean's immensity echoing around our submersible, I gather the courage to voice my fear. John, I begin, my voice barely more than a whisper, the tension within me giving it an edge. You're not it, are you? The question hangs heavy in the still air of the vessel, marking a line we've been careful not to cross until now. John looks at me, his gaze intense, study. For a moment, he doesn't respond, and in that silence, every dark possibility spirals in my mind. Finally, he breaks the silence, his voice mirroring my own uncertainty. I could ask you the same, Liz. His words strike me like a cold wave, sending a shudder through my body. The tension between us continues to mount, even as we try to confront it head on. I take a deep breath, knowing that this conversation is necessary, even if it's difficult. What was the name of the dive bar we first met in? The one in Norfolk. Sea dogs, John replies without hesitation. And you were trying to convince everyone that squid were smarter than dolphins. Almost started a bar fight over it. The memory brings a small smile to my lips, a brief moment of relief in this tense atmosphere. But the uncertainty remains, nagging at the edges of our thoughts. Just because the creature can mimic us doesn't mean it can't access our memories. Okay, I say, my mind racing for another question. What did we promise each other when we got assigned this expedition? The promise we made after our last mission went south. John's eyes meet mine, and for a moment, I see something akin to the old friendship there. We promised to get each other home, no matter what. His answer strikes a chord in me, the memory of that promise flooding back, but I can't let the nostalgia blind me. I look at him intently, the reality of our situation never far from my mind. And do you still intend to keep that promise, John? He doesn't answer right away, but when he does, his voice is firm, filled with the determination I recognize. Yes, Liz, I do. The conversation isn't a perfect solution, but it does something to ease the tension between us, even if only slightly. Our interactions are imbued with a chilling question. Am I speaking to my trusted friend, or am I dealing with a horrifying mimic? A couple of days filled with tension pass by, and the submersible shudders with a violence that sends my heart racing. Warning lights blink to life across the control panel, bathing the interior in a harsh, blood-red glow. Alarms screech through the vessel, a shrill cry echoing off the metallic walls. Something hits us, an unseen force in the darkness outside. The impact jolts the vessel, throwing us off our feet. I slam against the consoles, aim flaring out my side. John stumbles too, struggling to keep his footing. The metallic groan of the vessel fills my ears, the submersible buckling under immense pressure. The floor tilts beneath us, all equipment not bolted down sliding with a cacophony of crashes. The once orderly lab space is a chaos of disarray. Instruments flicker and die, others sputter sporadically. 
The navigation console sparks, a plume of smoke billowing out. A chill runs through me as I see the communications panel go dark. We are cut off, disconnected from our base on the surface. We scramble to stabilize the vessel, working with trained precision despite the chaos around us. But the submersible is critically damaged, its vital systems compromised. The thrum of the engine is weaker, faltering. A grim dread seizes me as I realize the hull could breach under the relentless pressure of the deep sea. In the dimly lit control room, John and I set to work, our focus solely on the damaged submersible and the urgent need for repairs. Each of us takes on a task suited to our respective skills. John, with his naval background, possesses an intimate knowledge of our communication systems. He kneels before the panel, prying open the shell to reveal a complex network of wires and circuits. His hands, steady despite the high stakes, maneuver through the tangled web. He tests connections, reroutes wires, and replaces burnt-out components plucked from our dwindling supply. His brows furrow in concentration as he battles against time to restore our link to the outside world. On the other hand, I dive into the power systems. With a background in marine biology, I'm not the most obvious choice for the job, but my years in the field have given me a functional understanding of the submersible's life-supporting mechanics. I find myself in front of the power consoles, its usual hum reduced to a sporadic stutter. My hands, donned in protective gloves, work diligently. I trace lines of power, looking for interruptions, hunting down the anomaly that caused our lights to flicker and wane. I cross-check each segment and test each node, my eyes flicking back and forth between the manual and the complex panel before me. Through our endeavors, we aim to keep the submersible functional, to hold the vast, unforgiving ocean at bay. The work is challenging and demanding, but we press on, driven by the instinct of survival. We have no other choice. Between the repairs and the fear, the idea begins to take root in my mind. It's risky, but it might just be our only chance. John, I begin, my voice carrying an uncharacteristic firmness. We need to outwit the creature. He looks at me, apprehension clear in his eyes, but he nods. I'm listening. Our fear, our suspicion, it's exactly what it wants. It's how it divides and conquers. We need to use that against it. I explain my plan, a game of deceit where we pretend to turn against each other, a ruse to draw the creature out. John understands. He sees the danger, but also the potential. We don't voice our agreement, our commitment to the plan, but it's there in our shared, determined gaze. The time for our performance comes. Our aim is simple yet challenging to lure the shadow creature out of its hiding, to force it into the open. Our argument begins. Loud accusations, fueled by false anger, echo through the narrow confines of the submersible. Our words of blame and suspicion are not for each other, but for our unseen audience, the predator lurking in the shadows. This is our bait, a trap for the creature that's been picking us off one by one. Our hope lies in its instincts, in its predatory nature that craves conflict, that seizes opportunities when its prey is vulnerable and divided. As we argue, the climax of our charade looms. We transition from verbal sparring to a physical confrontation, a fight that carries an illusion of authenticity. John attacks me, his movements swift and calculated. I react, allowing myself to be thrown back to portray the image of a struggling prey. The moment we've been waiting for arrives, the creature takes the bait. It can't resist the spectacle we've put on, the promise of easy prey and our supposed vulnerability. From the shadows, it reveals itself a momentary lapse in its otherwise flawless mimicry. Seizing this opportunity, John springs into action. He launches the makeshift electromagnetic pulse device we've created from scavenged materials. The aim is to disrupt the creature's form, to throw it off balance, even if just for a moment. The pulse finds its target, and the response is immediate. The shadow creature writhes in agony, its form spasming, flickering like a faulty light. It's as though the shadows themselves scream in pain. But we're not fooled. This isn't victory. This is merely a reprieve, a short-lived triumph. The precious seconds of peace flee from us as quickly as they arrived, and the cold, pressing reality of our situation reasserts itself. It's time to ascend. The creature, our own personal specter of the deep, though weakened by our improvised device, is far from defeated. It remains within the confines of our submersible, a persistent threat lurking in every corner, every shadow. The navigation consoles, my beacon in the encompassing gloom, winks a dim, faltering light at me. 
its array of buttons and gauges seems to pulsate under the submarine's flickering illumination. The once familiar consoles now feels alien, each blink a Morse code of challenges we're about to face. John, I call out my voice echoing in the confined space of the cockpit, my eyes never straying from the pulsating screens before me. The urgency underlying my voice adds weight to the single word that forms his name. His response slices through the tense silence, immediate and resolute. Let's get out of here, Bliss. The enormity of our task looms large. It's not as simple as commanding the submersible to rise. It's a delicate dance against the physics of our surroundings. The crushing pressure of the ocean depths, the stifling darkness outside, and the lack of knowledge about the unexplored marine terrain all compound into formidable challenges. We commence our journey upwards, all the while conscious of the fact that our biggest adversary isn't the forbidding ocean outside, but the alien entity within our ranks, its strength slowly returning. As the submersible jerks into motion, beginning its strenuous ascent, the hostile, crushing darkness of the sea depths feels like a secondary concern. We find ourselves trapped in an uncanny survival contest, performing the dual roles of both the hunted and the hunter. Our otherworldly adversary, despite being temporarily disoriented, is far from harmless. We are forced to stay on our guard, primed for defensive action or a swift counterstrike if the moment calls for it. Our ascent is a dangerous juggling act. One part of our attention is fixated on handling the mechanics of the submersible, while another is vigilant of a lurking entity. My fingers dance on navigation controls, executing commands with practiced ease, while my other hand clenches an improvised weapon, a jagged piece of metal home to a point. Each groan of the hull, each fluttering, unsteady flash of light casts eerie, shifting shadows around us. They twist and wave, potential hiding spots for the creature to emerge from. Yet our fear can't be the anchor that restrains us. Our mission is paramount. We must breach the surface before the creature regains its full strength. Our trust, previously frayed and strained to its breaking point, starts to weave itself back together, stronger, more resilient. John, I say in my voice a contrasting note of vulnerability amidst the mechanical drone of the submersible's engines. Whatever comes next, I need you to know. I trust you. His eyes, flicking towards me, mirror a glint of surprise before consolidating into a determined resolve. The feelings mutual is, we're a team. His words, although simplistic, ring with sincerity. The darkness of the sea depths gives way to the subtle light of the upper ocean as we near the surface. But our hopeful ascent is interrupted by a ferocious surge of activity from the creature. It returns with a vengeance, its power seemingly strengthened by desperation or perhaps the proximity to the surface. It materializes before me, a towering form of pure darkness. Its presence engulfs me, monstrous and formidable. My heart pounds in my chest, but my focus sharpens on the lone escape pod within my reach. Suddenly, the creature lunges at me, its form morphing, swirling like a storm of shadows. But John is quicker. Liz, get in. He bellows, throwing himself headlong into the creature with the recklessness of someone who has already made peace with their fate. The creature's attention shifts, focusing on this new, aggressive adversary. John's desperate ploy works. He has bought me the time I need. Without wasting another second, I break into a sprint, propelling myself toward the escape pod. As I throw a last glance over my shoulder, I see John embroiled in a brutal dance with the creature. With frantic haste, I climb to the pod, my hands flying over the controls with a familiarity born of countless drills. The pod disengages from the main vessel with a sudden jolt, the automated thrusters propelling me away from the ensuing chaos. The sight that greets me is heartbreaking. The submersible, with John still inside, begins to implode under the rapid pressure change. His face, caught in a moment of serene acceptance, burns itself into my memory. He shows it to give his life so that I might survive. My heart clenches in my chest at the realization. John, my friend, has thrown himself into the jaws of death to ensure my escape. As the escape pod breaches the surface, I am momentarily blinded by the sudden assault of sunlight. The icy, oppressive darkness of the deep gives way to the warm, golden light of day, a stark contrast that feels charring and almost unreal. After the cold isolation of the depths, the sun feels almost unbearably warm on my skin. Rescue is prompt, the surface team having tracked my escape pod. Strong hands haul me aboard the rescue vessel. As I collapse onto the deck, exhaustion threatening to overwhelm me, 
I was unable to tear my gaze from the calm and seemingly innocuous expanse of water I've emerged from. The haunting image of the submersible's implosion, of John's face locked in a fierce expression of determination, is carved deeply into my mind. I can still see the determination in his eyes and hear the finality in his voice. His sacrifice, a direct result of our blind curiosity, hangs heavily over me, hinting the relief of my rescue. The sweetness of survival is laced with a bitter aftertaste. We ventured into the deep, lured by the promise of knowledge and discovery, only to encounter a creature far beyond our understanding. A predator, intelligent, cunning, and incredibly adaptable. The entity that claimed John's life and the other crew members that forced us into a game of survival still lurks beneath us. Our understanding of the world, of the creatures that inhabit it, has been permanently shattered. As I look out across the vast, deceptively serene ocean, I make a silent vow to myself. I will not let John's sacrifice be in vain.